confusion just seems to reign supreme in this area, this whole issue in Christendom of the faith movement, what is of God, what isn't of God. You know, you hear anti-faith teaching, anti-faith movement teaching, but then do you feel comfortable giving up your faith then? Do you feel comfortable confessing negatively about something like, well, you know, I could just come down with a terrible sickness if I try to do something like that. Do you feel comfortable doing that? Just because you hear anti-faith movement teaching? Probably not. Probably not. But then are you comfortable just always saying everything is going to be great for me, everything's going to go perfectly my way, everything's going to be rosy for me? Probably not. And what do you say? Well, I just say nothing then. Well, Proverbs says that might be wise to do. Just hold your tongue in and don't say anything. Well, that's an explosive issue we were trying to set forth in an introductory message last time. I have no idea how far we're going to go in this. But the more I get into it, it seems like the more I, I can't stay out of it, the more I want to get into it and get into it further than I had planned even to begin with. It's a movement where either you're in it or you're out of it. We saw last time there aren't a whole lot of fit sitters when it comes to this, this doctrine of the faith movement. It's in charismatic circles. It's known very, very well outside of charismatic circles. As a matter of fact, there have been several books, even of recent times, written by non-charismatics, criticizing, of course, they're certainly not praising, criticizing this health and wealth gospel, the extremes of this health and wealth gospel that so many of these charismatics are teaching us, telling us that now these are some new things. We're a special class of Christians who believe all the Bible literally. God's been looking for people for hundreds and hundreds of years, they tell us for people who will believe all of the Bible literally without any interpretation, without any of man's opinions, with no denominational traditions, just the pure, naked truth of the Word of God. Now, if you come on Sunday, we're going to do something a little special in addition to what we normally do on Sunday. And it's a little interesting uh, what people will say, oh, God, we thank you that you've blessed us with the pure, naked, just the absolute final truth of your word. And the person is just teaching things right off the wall. And yet they're so deluded and so deceived that in their prayers they will pray and thank the Lord that you've shown us the full truth, the total truth, nothing but the truth. There's no admixture of man's ideas or doctrines or suppositions or traditions. It's just the pure word of God. And you just roll off your chair laughing at the unscriptural statements that are made, thinking the poor deceived soul the whole time, thinking that he's really got the whole pure naked truth of the Bible. And these people in the faith movement believe they're a special class of Christians. Now, they might not come right out and say it, or they might really take it humbly. They may not get in a lot of pride, but they still believe we are a first-class, special group of Christians who believe all the Bible literally as it stands. And so then you've got those who are without the movement who are more and more looking on these people with a skeptical eye. What are these people really after, after all? Why are they really in this movement? What is, it that has, what is it that has brought this rise of a health and wealth, in other words, a material emphasis of so many important, so many perhaps famous biblical passages? Some of them, I just have so much material, I just, uh, you almost have to like, take a book and say we're going to teach this chapter by chapter and point out all the mistakes. There's just so much material. You've got to find some way to lump it all together and begin looking at it. Here's what one author had to say about the problems now, the increasing problems that faithers, you have to get accustomed to that term, you're either a faither or a non-faither, first time you spell it, it looks like a cross between a father and a feather, but he's a faither, <laughs> faithers or non, non-faithers that are in this, this faith or non-faith movement, one or the other. But increasingly the faithers are running into problems. This author writes, the controversy over faith has generated a substantial element of opposition to faith teaching, which is growing more vocal and more powerful by the moment. 
These opponents of faith are attempting to purge faith teaching from the charismatic movement. By depicting faith teaching as an aberration, a form of humanism, or a sub-Christian doctrine, it is being forced into the fringe of the charismatic movement. Earlier, faith teachers enjoyed broad acceptance while ministering in the mainstream of the charismatic renewal. Recently, however, faith ministers are finding that fewer groups outside of their own circles are opening their doors to the message. In fact, many churches and individuals are purging their libraries of faith literature, which is now seen as some sort of new error. Where do we go from here with the faith movement? Are the adherents of faith teaching willing to be pushed out of the broader charismatic community? Are faith teachers willing to minister to increasingly smaller numbers of people in increasingly more isolated groups? Well, he writes, only future actions within faith circles will tell us about that. And I guess that's true. The resistance element to the faith movement is becoming more vocal. And generally, when it becomes something becomes more vocal, it's becoming more powerful at the same time because we're finding that the faithers seem to be shrinking in number. Oh, whenever it first was introduced, everybody wanted to become a faither until you walk the faith walk several years. You claim things by faith, see if this has ever happened to you, and it never materializes. <laughs> you claim that healing for that head cold, and you've got it for six months. And so then you start thinking now, what are we into here? Are we into something that can be supported with the Word of God? Are we into some fringe Christian movement that is based on pseudo-understanding from biblical verses? I mean, as just about every minister maybe who has ever ministered has said, including myself, you can base anything you want to on the Bible. It just depends on how you want to look at a passage. You can base anything. Homosexuality up or down the ladder, you could find support for that in the Bible. So what about the faith movement? Is that one of those things down the ladder from homosexuality or up the ladder, but still a fringe doctrine based on pseudo conceptions of the Bible? Well, I think that confusion is entering into the picture more and more. Yet the people in the faith controversy will not admit to any confusion except on the part of their opponents. The faithers say, well, we're not confused about anything. The word of God is clear on this matter. We're not confused in the least about anything. The word of God is clear. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. If he said a thing, he'll do it. If he's spoken it, he'll make it good. Confusion, we're not confused. There's no confusion at all. The only confusion that exists in the movement is with our opponents because they have forsaken the word of God with their doubt and unbelief. That's why they're confused. The non-faithers say confusion. We're not confused. The word of God is very clear. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Job had boils. Trophimus was sick. Epaphroditus was sick. Jesus said those that are sick need a physician. Luke was the beloved physician. The Bible is very clear on this matter of healing and prosperity and so forth. Jesus said rich men will not enter the kingdom of God. Paul said that the love of money is the root of all evil. This matter is clear. The only people who are confused are the faithers who reinterpreted the biblical message in light of the materialistic society, America, in which they were born. So you see the problem that we have. No one will admit to confusion on their part. It's just the other people are confused. I think the confusion is in both camps up. It's just that the people sometimes won't come right out and admit it. As we go over articles and books through the next few weeks, you'll see what I'm talking about. There have been many people in this faith movement who go along for a while and things don't work, and because they've been bombarded so many times with this positive confession message, maybe they won't come out and say something about it. But the gears of their mind are working, though. They're beginning to wonder, let's say maybe doubt, Maybe have a little unbelief mixed in with all of this that, no, wait just a minute, let's hold steady. Maybe, maybe, maybe we've gone too fast with this new doctrine, with this new movement, that it really can't be supported in the scriptures. Maybe as some of our critics are saying, this gospel of wealth only works in affluent America. 
It doesn't work in Latin America. Are we really, really going to believe that a bushman in Africa is going to get a new Cadillac if he claims one? Let's be sensible and, and reasonable. Not doubting God, let's just be sensible and reasonable about these things. That God's going to give a bushman a Cadillac because he reads a faith book translated into his language? Well, in my mind, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Maybe he'll get a better donkey or something, but... You know, the way it's presented here in this country of fur coats for your wives and diamond rings for both of you and cars for both of you. Our critics say those against the faith movement now, these things really don't work, and they begin to think. And then those who are non-faithers, they remember a time or two where they know someone was supernaturally healed in their church. The doctors gave them up. They know God healed them. So they're anti-faith, but yet in the back of their mind, but wait a minute, I know of a case where God did, God did heal me at one time. I remember when I was a little girl and my mother prayed for me and I remember I got healed as a result of that. You see what I'm talking about? Confusion on both sides because people on both sides of the issue have experienced both parts of it. The faithers have experienced failure. The non-faithers have experienced success. They've experienced victory in some areas. And yet they still, each on one side or, or the other, will take the dominant position. Either you've seen more success or failure than the other, or at least you would like to see more success than the other. And so you'll adopt one position or the other. Confusion? Does confusion exist in your mind about the faith movement, the healing movement, the blood of Jesus movement, the angels movement, the prosperity movement, the Psalm 91 movement, the divine protection movement? Well, let's take a little test then to see whether or not it, it exists in your mind. We should really have more of this dialogue involved in our church. Hopefully, maybe in ethics or theology, somehow we can start working into it more because it'll make all of us think a little more about the whole matter as things are racing through your mind. Do you believe? <laughs> we'll ask probably, uh, well, the most debated question, maybe, maybe not the most debated, I take that back, but maybe the most significant, the most important question in the movement, do you believe that healing, divine healing, bodily healing, is in the atonement? Well, raise your hand if you believe that. <laughs> healing is in the atonement. Now you, now, you think with me as we go along here. Okay, what are you basing that on? And, which is a quote, Isaiah 53. Which is a quote, Isaiah 53. First Peter 2, Matthew 8 quotes Isaiah 53. We got on this a little bit last time. It's healing in the atonement, bodily healing in the atonement. You say, yes, it is in the atonement on the basis of Isaiah 53. Miracles, miracles? what about miracles? Mm -hmm. Well, that wouldn't answer the question whether healing's in the atonement. Jesus did miracles. That'd bring up another question, are miracles for today? Jesus did them back then. But what we're going to have to learn through this class, as well as what we'll have to learn through every study that we do around here, is proper exegesis of, of events and ideas and passages. Just because someone did something back then doesn't mean that you have any right or any basis to do it for yourself. And that's a major mistake in charismatic interpretation. They see that Isaiah did something. They see that Ezekiel did something. They see that Elijah and Elisha did something. They see that Moses experienced something. They see that Jesus and the apostles worked miracles. And generally, the charismatic interpretation is, I'm off on your topic right now, the charismatic interpretation is to say Jesus worked miracles. And Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means if he worked miracles then, he still works miracles today. That's, that's totally wrong exegesis, whether the question or the answer is right or not is beside the point. Who told you that you could draw the concept of Christ working miracles and tie it to Hebrews 13, 8 and prove that it's true for day? If it's the same yesterday, today, forever, will he work healing miracles in heaven? 
That's part of forever. Will he work healing miracles there? So this question of miracles is a separate question entirely. Jesus worked miracles. The apostles worked miracles. But you get past the first century church, and you don't find very many miracles. You find Catholic substitutes for miracles, but not real miracles, though, not like in the book of Acts in the first century. Why? What happened? Biblical, they fell away, apostate church, they lost the Holy Spirit, so they lost the faith, so they lost the ability to work the gifts, or what? And now God in these last days, remember that wasn't last days, that was a long time ago. In these last days, God is now restoring those saints? That hardly makes sense. But anyway, back to the atonement question. So do you mean to tell me that you <coughs> believe something that is based on one and only one passage in all of the Bible? Isn't that kind of, you know, when, I, when, when, you, when you hear it said like that, isn't that kind of stretching? You have to stretch your mind to really grasp that. Christ's death, we know, is a central thing of both Testaments. It's a central thing of the history of the globe, is Jesus' death on the cross. And Isaiah 53, in its spiritual import, that is the forgiveness of our sins, salvation, deliverance from our sins, is just covered umpteen times in the New Testament. Why not the healing connection there also? When the New Testament authors are drawing upon Isaiah 53, or simply speaking of Christ's atonement, it's always in some spiritual, and therefore, some people would argue by exclusion, therefore it's not talking about some natural area then. Well, now there's a, just, there's a simple, probably the most significant question in the faith movement. And we could just ask anybody. We're asking you now as a test question, and it looked like most of you, if, if not all of you, raised your hands, yes, I believe healing is in the atonement, but we ask you for your biblical basis for that. Now, we know what charismatic ministers have taught us, they have just told us over and over, healings in the atonement, healings in the atonement, healings in the atonement. How do we know Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53? But is that enough? Is that proper? Is it even wise, spiritually or scripturally wise, to base such an important belief on one passage that, guess what, it's not even in the King James, is it? They tell us this is what the Hebrew says here, not griefs and sorrows, but sicknesses and pains. Have you ever looked it up yourself in the Hebrew? Have you ever studied it on your own in the Hebrew? Now you see what we're reducing this to. You mean we're talking about believing such, something that is so important, so crucial on one passage that in our Bible doesn't even give it to us, but that someone else tells us that the Hebrew does give that to us in the original language, in the early manuscripts. Whew, that's pretty shaky. I mean, I wouldn't want my salvation to be based on that. That it's covered nowhere in the Bible but back in Leviticus uh, 23. And you have to know the Hebrew to get it out of that past. My salvation? Based it on something like that? Whew, that'd be pretty shaky. That really would be. <laughs> well, what are we going to do with this divine healing business then? We're asking, does confusion exist in the faith movement? Well... From that question, it should exist in your mind unless you have all these things already settled and ironed out. It's an important question. It's something very, very important. Something as major and as significant as that. Let's go on to another little test area in the same area. If you think of one you want to raise, feel free to raise it. Do you lock your doors whenever you go to bed at night? front and back door. Why? Some of you are shaking your head yes. How many of you do? You want to raise your hands? Oh, okay. They're going to they're gonna let us know. Bunch of downers in here. They're going to let us know. <laughs> okay, now that's half and half. So here we got a good gang now because we got two sides here. The skins and the shirts are against one another now. <laughs> okay, why? Why do you like... Why do you lock your door? Now, it's probably not to keep yourself in your house. <laughs> Someone might say, well, it's to keep my child inside. Probably not. If they're big enough to reach the door, they can probably be big enough to unlock the door. You're keeping someone out. Why? You don't want them in. Why? Going to harm you? Steal something? 
Well, why would you be concerned about that? Is God not willing to protect you <laughs> and your possessions in every way and in every area? Is that a manifestation of doubt? To lock your door? I mean, you're going to have to give us a reason why you do it, why you lock your door. Oh, that's, that really puts the blame on someone else in. Makes you feel good. Remove the temptation for someone else. Oh. Of course, I'm not doubting, but I wouldn't want to cause them to sin. I'm not saying that's a wrong, I'm just saying I've heard that many times. Remove, tem <laughs> Remove temptation. Come on. That would only work if you live next door to a state pen or something, you know. Maybe you lived in a nice neighborhood, a really nice neighborhood that removed temptation. I mean, so many houses around. What, do you, what makes you think they're going to come to your house? But you're afraid that someone's going to come to your house and do something. I mean, that's very obvious. You lock your car whenever you go in a parking lot of a big supermarket. Say, my car's not worth stealing, so I don't like mine. <laughs> Let's say that it was worth stealing. <laughs> I hope they do take it, praise God. <laughs> Leave me a check for it or something. <laughs> oh, let's, let's say you don't like your car, but whenever you get out, you put that tape player underneath the front seat. Why? Why did you do that? Are you afraid someone's going to come and see that and steal it then? then are you not operating on a principle of unbelief? Unbelief. You do not believe God. <laughs> You're laughing. What's, what's wrong with that, brother? I mean, why else, why else would you hide that? You're not hiding it just so you can play hide and seek when you get back and see if you can find it or something. <laughs> you hide it because you are afraid someone else is going to steal that from you. You do not want them to take your property. I mean, you're really a deeper life Christian. You do not want them to take your property. <laughs> You're going to lock the doors, put it underneath the seat. Half of you raise your hands that you lock your doors on your house. Maybe some would raise their hands. We lock our doors on our cars as well. Would it make any difference what neighborhood you were in as to whether you lock the doors of your car? You'd lock it in a, in a worse neighborhood? You'd lock your doors? Why? Is God, is God any more restricted because of the neighborhood that you're in to protect you? Doesn't, according to the Old Testament, aren't we looking for extreme times that Israel falls into whenever God really works his best and most glorious deliverance? It's not where everything is going fine, but in extreme times where we really see the Lord work. Now, if you are thinking, I'm not confused about any of this, you ought to think differently now. How do you answer all, all of these things? I mean, are you one of the ones who says now it's wrong to buy life insurance or accident insurance for yourself? You have any accident insurance for yourself? Why not? You're not going to have an accident? Haven't you had some in the last few years or months or something? <laughs> <laughs> so you're one of those that puts your head up against the wall. Well, I'm not, I've made up my mind. Don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> I am not going to act as though I'm doubting God. It doesn't seem to be working. I still have accidents. But aren't we told that if you buy accident insurance, that's the same as confessing you're going to need it sometime in the future, right? What's the difference between locking your doors? You're confessing that you're going to need that door locked sometime in the future. What's the difference then? You want to be the teacher for next week now and say, now, we've got to explain this. What's the difference? You can't do one but not the other and say, I've got biblical grounds for this and no biblical grounds for that. <laughs> you're either a faither or a non-faither. Between a father and a feather, you're either a faither or a non-faither. <laughs> What are you now? Some of you look like you're non-faithers out there. Here we're a faith church. We've got half non-faithers in here. Lock their doors, but you'd let someone have a tongue thrashing if they had any fire insurance. So why a fire insurance? Except maybe your house could possibly, no one knows, could burn down in the future. Well, no one knows whether someone's going to break into your house. But I thought...
Christians, faithers, they knew according to the promises of God. No evil shall befall me. No plague come nigh my dwelling. My dwelling, no evil, no plague. Then why would you want to guard it and protect it? You don't have dogs, probably, or fences, or guards, or surveillance systems, but you lock your doors. You don't have insurance. I mean, it seems like here's the problem we're in. We live a dialectical life here. We say yea to God when it comes to faith in this area, nay to God when it comes to faith in this area. Why? Why do we make a distinction there? Except that insurance is kind of, accident insurance is kind of, uh, just kind of in the future somehow, you know. But you live in a house and someone would break in your house, you've got uh, more at stake right there because it's something that seems to be so immediate and so real and called such a fear in someone's life and someone's heart. And so you do something with that that you don't do. See, I'd get fired as a faith preacher for saying things like this. But what I'm saying is the truth, though. Amen. We're just bringing up the obvious facts of our existence and sometimes the, the obvious figures that just don't mesh of the existence of faithers out there. You keep your child away from the service whenever they have a certain ailment or a disease. So I just bring them here. Oh, you bring them and make the rest of us sick here? Well, we're supposed to be covered by the blood of Jesus so that we don't get sick if we bring a sick child here. Well, let's talk about whether the disease is communicable or not. Now, if it's a communicable disease, then definitely we keep our child away. Why? Why would you do that? Except you're afraid someone else is going to catch the same disease. So you say, all right, I won't be afraid. And you bring them and everybody does. <laughs> what should you have done then? <laughs> you see all the contradictions we have on our hands? That people with their little glib formulas just say, whoo, just praise the Lord, believe him, or just whoo, praise the Lord, don't believe him. One way or the other, and it's just in a neat little box that no, these things aren't for today, or yes, these things are for today. And yet those of us who think it all, we struggle with the in-between times, the meanwhile, the ground that's in between these extremes over here and these extremes over there to end up with what really is the biblical view right here. All these people have just gone along for years saying, now the Lord's teaching us divine healing, but there's a better thing according to the book of Exodus in the 23rd chapter, divine health. Yeah, nobody has divine health. I mean, all those people saying God's giving us divine health now. They don't have divine health. I know of one minister who says he hadn't been sick in 50 years. He's lying because I've read his own books where he said he was sick. How do you get around that? Well, by faith I wasn't sick. Well, come on now. We can say by faith the sun doesn't exist then. I mean, you're just denying obvious realities. Oh, well, by faith. Oh, then they say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what's legally ours or legally not ours. Now, we are sick, but, 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 but we're not sick. What do you mean by that? Well, it might look like we are, but by faith we're not. Legally we're not. Well, now you're getting me all confused now. You either are sick or you aren't sick. <laughs> what do you mean you are but you aren't? Well, you say I am, but I'm not going to confess it. Well, whether you confess it or not, you still are, though. So what's your confession have to do with it then? You still are. <laughs> Up or down, left or right, you're still sick. Well, the devil would bind me with my confession. Well, he's already bound you. <laughs> you're already bound with a spirit of infirmity. And you, the whole time, the whole week prior to that, you were saying, oh, no plague will come nigh my dwelling, no evil will befall me, and it fell right smack on top of you. So the faithers say, well, it's Numbers 23, 19. God's faithful anyway. Even if I can't explain it, God's faithful anyway. The non-faithers say Numbers 23, 19 doesn't apply. You've misinterpreted Psalm 91. No evil and no plague. But the faithers say, but no means no. Evil and plague mean evil and plague. Well, how do you reconcile the two? They get them together at all over this. Few people want to find out. Few people want to find out. We've got distortions from both sides of the picture blowing something out of proportion 
because this one person tried it and just died. I mean, it was a grotesque, suffering, agonizing death. They tell us that to scare us away from trying to believe God. The faith people tell us an account where, oh, it was just an impossible case. The doctors had given them up. They were miraculously healed. Well, we're stuck still, though. Someone tried it and died trying. Faithers say, well, it was because of their unbelief. Well, was that really why they died? Was it because of their unbelief? Are you going to accuse Elisha, the Lord's prophet, of unbelief? He died in 2 Kings chapter 13. He died of a sickness, if you will, in 2 Kings 13. You're going to accuse him of unbelief? He was the Lord's prophet. Say, well, even prophets miss it. That's right. Maybe you have too. Maybe you have in your understanding of the Bible. If a prophet can miss it, why can't you then? Your understanding of the Bible. Well, I still want to believe it. Well, that's generally what it boils down to. People still want to believe whatever it is, either a pro or a con position. So we're going to start this evening. We've already started. We've been going a long time. Looking at the opposing positions and trying to paint a picture, hopefully not a stereotyped erroneous caricature, but a correct picture of the fors and the against, the pros and the cons, the faithers and the non-faithers to better explain to you what we're talking about, what the whole movement is over. Let's look at the fours, the faithers, and paint a picture of those who are for the end time message of faith. Now what makes this so new and so different is not the topic of faith. I'll start with this. Maybe you've never thought of it like this. What makes this movement so new? It's not the topic of faith. That was probably one of the most important topics during the Reformation period was the topic of faith. No, it's not the topic of faith, but it's the application topic to faith but it's the application of this message primarily the application to material items that makes it so new and so different to anything that we've seen before so don't let someone tell you faith is new or the faith message the faith topic faith as something to discuss is new that was important in Paul's ministry the topic of faith you find it throughout Romans and Galatians, as well as the book of Hebrews, as well as other New Testament books. And it was important for the Reformation times. No, we're not talking about a new topic. We're talking about a different, unusual, not seen heretofore, application of the topic, and that is the application to material items. Now, the faithers will tell us that Christians are missing out on certain blood-bought inheritance rights that they rightfully and legally possess as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. A lot is made over this inheritance rights business. Analogies are frequently drawn <clears throat> on the basis of passages like Romans 8, Galatians 4, and Hebrews 9 that if you have a father who's rich, a brother who's rich, an uncle who's rich, or whatever. He puts your name in his will. And of course, we know what rich means here on the earth. We mean in money, in goods, in property, real estate, cars, or whatever. And he dies. Then those are called inheritance rights. Like from your father, you inherit those things. Those rightfully belong to you. Because we're an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, Romans 8, Galatians 4, when he died, Hebrews chapter 9, then we are to gain benefit from these rights called inheritance rights that have been left us. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 speaks of the inheritance that the Christian has, blood-bought inheritance. And, of course, this would include such notable things as health and wealth. They tell us all of these promises of healing and prosperity 
have been true and been in the Bible all along, but hidden to the eyes of institutional religion. We're trying to paint a picture of the faithers, and we'll get to the non-faithers here in a moment. These promises aren't new for healing or prosperity. They've been in the Bible all along but they've been hidden to the eyes of the institutional church. Why? Why hidden for so many years to the eyes of institutional church members? Well, they give us several reasons. First of all, they tell us that around the 4th century A.D., the church lost the experience of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when you lose the Spirit, you lose your insight to the Word of God. They tell us, secondly, because the church has been controlled by a spirit of unbelief for all of these centuries. Therefore, how could the promises of God, the promises of God, much is made about the promises, the promises of God, how could they be given or revealed to these people because they've lost the Holy Spirit and they're controlled by doubt and unbelief? And thirdly, their teachings are nothing but that based on the traditions of men. They have given up the clear, clear, plain, plain, pure, pure teachings of the Bible on prosperity and physical health. And God in these last days, these last days of the 20th century, is making an attempt to awaken his church to the full redemption they have in Christ. That's another phrase that you'll hear. Full redemption. Full redemption means that you have spiritual salvation and physical and material as well. That's full redemption. Full redemption that we have in Christ. Now, the attitude of the faithers, of the non-faithers, is that, well, the non-faithers are almost non-Christians because of their doubt. And the faithers tell us that doubt and unbelief well, let me say that some faithers make a difference between the two, like Charles Capps makes a big difference between doubt and unbelief. Others put it in the same general category as being the most abominable of all sins in the Bible for the Christian. You ever heard that, that doubt is the biggest sin? Doubt and unbelief would be the most abominable sin for the Christian. And they reason along this, this train of thought. If you cannot believe God for these simple material items, such as prosperity and healing, if you, can, if you cannot believe God for these, then how do you know you even have your salvation? It's an interesting line of reasoning. They base that on a passage over in Mark chapter 2, where Jesus asks the question, which is easier? Or I think King James words it, whether is easier to say to the son of man or to this, this, this man that is sick of palsy, to say to this man, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and take thy bed and walk. And then he more or less by the actions in the next few verses, that'd be verses 10 and 11, in the next few verses, he more or less through the actions gives us the answer as to which of those they say, their interpretation would be, is easier for the Christian. And therefore, because salvation of your soul, they tell us, is something harder to get, it's something more difficult to get, that if you cannot just believe God for the simple things, material blessings, physical blessings, then how can you possibly obtain the greater blessing of salvation how do you know that you've got the greater blessing of salvation if you don't have these other things? Maybe we, better need, maybe we better turn over to that passage. We better because I think we need to. Mark chapter 2. This is a popular current line of thought. Of the attitude of the faithers to the non-faithers are almost non-Christians because of their doubt and unbelief. And doubt and unbelief constitute the most abominable of all sins for the Christian. Because they reason if you can't believe God for these simple material items, how can you believe God or how at least can you know that you have believed God for your salvation? Mark 2 and verse 9. Let's look at the verse that they use, though, and see if that's what Jesus said. <laughs> Maybe you've never noticed the verse, the very verse that is used. Whether is easier. 
to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. Now, do you notice anything in that verse that maybe you have never noticed before? He didn't ask the question, which is easier to get? Which is easier to believe for? The emphasis is a totally different emphasis. He didn't say, which is easier for you to believe for, for you to get? He said, which is easier for me to say? The word say there is used twice. Now, that gives us a whole, it gives me, I hope it does you, that gives you a whole different coloring to the passage here then and a whole different coloring to this whole argument of doubt and unbelief, that it's the greatest sin. And you can prove that by the fact if you can't believe for simple things, that proves that you can't believe for big things. It's not what the passage says at all. The whole thrust of the passage is put back on Jesus, or rather he places it on himself. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. All I'll have you note now is that nowhere do we find a connection which is easier for the man to believe for here, to get healing or to get salvation. And since salvation is more difficult, then we know we have to have healing first because if we can't have what's easier, how do we know we can get what's more difficult or that we have gotten what's more difficult? The passage doesn't even make that connection. The passage is not talking about the individual, but talking about Christ. What is easier for him to say or to do for the individual? So anyway, the picture continues along this line that we have an elite group of end timers. You've heard of old timers before. Well, these are end timers. An elite group of end timers according to Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. And, and some would even say we have Gideon's army of overcomers based on Judges 7 with Revelation chapters 2, 3, and 21. Well, before we get off that passage, let's just jump over that idea to Revelation chapter 2. <laughs> I was listening to a little boy teaching on this a few days ago, and <laughs> well, I'm amused. Just teaching right along here, telling us all the problems. Let's take Revelation 2, the first seven verses, just telling us all the problems that the church of Ephesus was having, and Jesus is warning the leadership there at the church of Ephesus, uh, thus and thus and thus and thus. Uh, left your first love and so forth, repent, you fall and do the first works and so forth. You know what? Then he, when he gets to verse 7, you know what he says? He said, all right, now verse 7 is very important because here's what the Lord has promised to us. I thought, but wait a minute. <laughs> You've been interpreting this historically in the context of the church in Ephesus the whole time. And all of a sudden when you got to that verse about overcomers, you said, now, this is what the Lord has for us, that we are the end time group of overcomers. Well, it would look like he's talking about the Ephesian Christians being the overcomers here. Some of them now, some of them wouldn't overcome. He's saying to him that does. In other words, to him that's part of the Ephesian church here, to him that overcomes here at Ephesus, will I do these various things. You know what the symmetry is here. Then verses 8 through 11, preaching about what's going on at Smyrna, 8, 9, 10, verse 11. And here's the word of the Lord to us in this end time generation. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the assemblies. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. I thought, uh-oh. I don't live in Smyrna. Now, my relatives do in Smyrna, Tennessee, but I don't live in Smyrna. And yet, 8, 9, and 10 don't apply to me, but verse 11 does. And yet, to me, it seems like, again, he's saying now, to those Christians who are in Smyrna, if you overcome, you'll not be hurt by the second death. In other words, he's giving a message to each individual church, ending with the same idea, either overcome or be overcome. And I would think, now, if that applies to me, why well, say it seven times here? But if you're talking to seven groups of people, you would need to say it seven times then. If you're talking to Latter-day Saints, just say it one time, I'm talking to Latter-day Saints. But you find it here in the context of the seven churches of Asia, and it's tacked on at the end to each group. If you overcome, this is yours. And the understanding is, if you don't overcome, this doesn't belong to you then. 
before even getting off this topic, what does what's an overcomer? John is the one writing this. John is the only one who uses the term elsewhere. First John chapter five and verse four. This is the victory that over 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 what overcomes the world. Even our faith. Oh, the end time message of faith. There we have it. First John five four. This is the victory that makes us overcomers is the message of faith. Well, we don't have time to get into that, at least right now, but you can get into John 5, 1 John chapter 5. He's talking about salvation there. This is the victory that overcomes our attachment to the world is faith. What type of faith? Faith for cars? Faith for healing? No. Faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation of our souls. This is what overcomes the world. The world is never pictured in the Bible as a lack of cars or a lack of healing. It's always pictured as, the, as, as something that's the antithesis to salvation in Jesus Christ. It is the opposite of the spiritual godly life is to live a part of this world. So the victory that overcomes not a lack of material or physical blessings, but the victory that overcomes the lack of salvation is faith in Christ which gives you salvation. That's where overcomer is used in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Hallelujah. Interesting. Have we gotten interesting, or is it just so boring you want to stop right now? We've gone about an hour. We might as well stop now. <laughs> How long? We could go on and on and on. I'm just getting into it. Well, this is what the faithers tell us. Are they wrong in what they say? I mean, let's take the opposite position, that to be spiritual... You have to be sick and poor. But does that really make sense? I mean, in other words, there appears to be some measure of truth in what they're saying about faith and healing and prosperity because if there's not some measure of faith or, or, or uh, validity to that, if there's not some measure, that means there's no measure. And if there's no measure, the only thing you can end up with is that if you want to be spiritual, then be poor and sick all your life. That doesn't seem to be exactly in line with scriptures. Poor and sick all of your life, the way the church depicts that, doesn't seem to be what the Bible teaches. What gave us the whole rise to this emphasis? I'm saying that faith is nothing new. The message of faith, the doctrine of faith, is nothing new. It's its application that's new. In, in this century, it's application to material items. Noted church historians today have pointed out that there may well be a connection between the origin of this message, that is the application of it to material items, that there may well be a connection. I'm not trying to get too historical, but it's very enlightening and very interesting to say this long sentence, that there may be a connection between the origin of this message and the materialistic bent of American society. Where did, that, where did that teaching have its origin? In South America, Japan, Africa? It had it here in the United States of America. And what has happened? No one can debate this fact. What has happened in America in the last uh, three quarters of a century? We've seen the most incredible increase in secularism and materialism that the world has, has ever known. Everything has a material, secular bent or tune to it. Everything does. If that is pervading the whole American scene, I sound like a church history professor when I say this, or one in sociology, but it's really something to think about. If it's pervading the whole American scene today, then who's to tell us or what's to stop it from influencing the church in America as well? that someone gets some idea that may be correct, God wants us to trust him. Christians have thought that all along. True Christians have. God wants us to trust him. What do you mean trust? In what areas? How? Well, you interpret that in light of your American experience, the roaring 20s, after the Second World War, the booming post-war years, and then the 1960s and 70s and 80s with its incredible increase in inventions and gadgets and time-saving devices, expensive cars. I mean, let's go back 100 years, maybe 100 plus years ago. There were no cars. 
How could you have a message of faith for believing God for new cars? There were no cars back then. Now we have cars. Now we have all of these material items today. Now we have this incredible increase in secular, secularism in American society. And in the Church of America as well, I'm sad to say. Is there not some connection between what we see going on in secular American society and how certain scriptural doctrines have been interpreted in the church in this century and in this century only? And you can look for roots of it, and you might find roots earlier in Christian history, but you'll never find what you're finding today. The end time message of faith, the health and wealth gospel of American Christianity. Interesting. Oh, they say, you're all, you guys are fighting about this because truth always divides. So does error. How do we know which one? Just because it divides doesn't mean it's true. Heresy divides too. That's no argument to say, well, I know I'm right because I lost my following. <laughs> because the truth always divides. Well, so does error. Let's go to the non-faithers. I hope you're now acquainted with the faithers. Meet the faithers. Let's meet the non-faithers now. The non-faithers paint with a, such a broad brush, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but they paint with a broad brush a group of Elmer Gantry slick religious hucksters, the Reverend Ike type, you know, that everyone who's in this message of faith, we're just in it for the money. We're in it to see whatever we can get out of it. Well, is that a fair caricature of everyone at all stages who are involved in the faith movement? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I think that's painting the picture with too broad of a brush. To say that we all, those of us who are, were, shall be in the faith movement are Elmer Gantry slick religious hucksters, a Reverend Ike type. You know the Reverend Ike type with all these fancy cars and homes and furs and so forth? Well, not everyone does that. <laughs> I'm sad to say too many do that, but not everyone does that. That's painting with maybe too broad of a brush. But anyway, we'll go on with the picture of the non-faithers. The non-faithers get quite upset with the faithers because the faithers make them look less spiritual. The non-faithers just go to church and say they love Jesus. The non-faithers. The faithers say we go all out for the Lord. We believe every promise in the book is mine. See, the non-faithers never sang that song in church. But the faithers sing that song all the time. Every promise in the book is mine. So that makes you more spiritual, so that just heats up to the boiling point this whole controversy here. They tell us that the faithers are secular humanists, many of which may even not be saved. Here one letter to the editor says, I hate to be critical of your magazine, yet the article about a certain faith preacher grieved my spirit deeply. I used to, be en I used to enjoy receiving your magazine. I'm a minister's wife and I always, I'm always looking for good literature that lifts up Christ. My husband and I have been in the ministry for 16 years. A few years back we were involved with the charismatic movement Yet as we began to study God's word and check different teachings and spirits against, against God's word, we found many discrepancies. Mentions two faithers. Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin both have teachings that have proved, at least in our area, to be very detrimental to spiritual growth. Obviously, this is a non-faither writing in this letter. Their teachings on faith, and especially prosperity, are almost blasphemous. In the charismatic movement, you never hear about holiness. You don't hear, let thy will be done, but only let my will be done. Another person writes in, as a minister of over 40 years in the Pentecostal tradition, I must protest with vigor the, supply, the implied support of your magazine that it is giving to the distorted theologies of the Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin camps. Their mutilations of the New Testament teachings have caused irreparable damage to the faith. Hundreds of vulnerable Christians have been misled 
and confused by their strange non-biblical teachings. That your magazine should give its support with the feature articles recently published extolling the ministries of the men and their heretical teachings is shocking. Now one writer tells us that it's near blasphemy to say these things and another tells us that it's not near anything. It's heretical. I mean it's overboard. It's just plain heretical these teachings. Well see what the faithers think of the non-faithers and what the non-faithers think of the faithers they both paint with a broad brush that someone is involved in Christian blasphemy or heresy here. Like I say it's not easy to get the two together and get them to discuss anything biblically. Now let's look at something else concerning the faithers and the non-faithers. Generally the way things are presented will, will be something like this. The faithers will start off their book, first chapter, first line, with a great miracle testimony. And then say, the Lord opened our eyes that miracles are still for today, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And they'll go on and find a few verses in the Bible to support that. They might tell us great financial miracles. For instance, you'll hear stories like this, that maybe my husband and I were in a charismatic meeting. He was having a lot of trouble at the job. We could tell that he'd be fired any day now because of various problems at the plant or at the office. And the charismatic minister was teaching on, well, you guessed it, prosperity that night the gift to get message that if we just sow money by faith how can you reap a harvest they say come on let's be farmers here how can you reap a harvest if you don't plant some seed we planted some seed our last fifty dollars and the next day my husband was fired and hired at another job for double the pay that he was making so we say bless God I'm gonna try that myself <laughs> we'll sow fifty the next meeting I go to if it works like that I'm gonna sow 150 the next meeting I go to start off with a great testimony. What about the non-faithers? They start off with a testimony like this it Was our only child He's dead now We felt so much condemnation and bondage in our life We were so wrong whenever we tempted God and Believed the logos whenever we should have waited for a rhema You know, it's these old emotional stories here telling us how great it was or how bad it was and expect us to believe. And many people just swallow that stuff. I'll either get into it or I'll either get out or stay away from it on the basis of these, these stories that have been read. For instance, here's a story of a former faither who became a non-faither. The words... I'm starting at the very beginning of his account now. This is the first word, the first line. The word stunned me, exclamation point. So you think, what's going on here? They left to join the faith movement, I was told. Pastors always hate to lose people. This couple was a special loss. They were making a real contribution. Suddenly, overnight, they decided to resign all positions and leave my church. Normally, I might have taken their leaving a bit more in stride. But the comment touched a wound that was still tender. They went to join the faith movement. Well, I myself had been raised in a classical Pentecostal church, and the supernatural element was certainly not new to me. Prayer for the sick and testimonies of healing decorated the services I attended as a growing boy. James 5, 14 to 15 was a reality to us. Miracles and the provision of God were considered normal to the church, not abnormal. Then during the early 1970s, a new dimension of faith was born into my heart. I became what some would call a faith preacher, building a church full of faith, consuming the literature of faith teachers and preaching heavy faith messages. I don't know what that means, but they were heavy, heavy faith messages. New sense of excitement gripped my ministry and those to whom I ministered. My spirit was intoxicated on the new wine of God's faith promises. I became more dependent on the Lord, more sensitive to answered prayer, and more aware of the God who is alive and who acts today. 
That's, that all sounds good. I was bolder in my declarations of what he would and could do. My self-perception as a catalyst in God's hands in a time-space world has a, had a positive effect on my self-confidence. It was therefore an unexpected shock when the orthopedic surgeon told us, your daughter will require surgery. Surgery, surgery, no, I thought. He explained that further treatment could cure her congenital hip malformation. It was a birth defect which had gone undetected until she was two years of age. Without surgery, she could be permanently disabled at an early age, even in her teens. I had consented to therapy, a compromise of my faith, I feared. How could I now submit to surgery? I had prayed and fasted. I knew God could heal her. I believe he had healed her. But the x-rays declared that her condition had not changed. You read stories like this all the time. The x-rays are a lie. God's word is true, I shouted inside. I was confused. I genuinely believed. I did not doubt God's ability, his willingness, nor his declaration. Scriptures just reeled in my mind. All things are possible to him that believeth, Mark 9, 23. With his stripes we're healed, Isaiah 53, 5. Have faith in God, Mark 11, 22 to 24. I believe those promises and more. Yet here we were, my wife, my five-year-old doctor, or daughter. I won't comment on that. The doctor, me, and those abominable x-rays. You know, people like that would like to just destroy the machine. But you need to deal with something else, though. That won't do anything. It's that machine, that blasted machine that's telling me that God's not true. It's a man against the machine. I'm trying my best to believe that God is faithful. I think we read earlier, I believed he had healed her. He's already healed. So the x-rays, what do you do with them? You call them a lie. Remember I said last week, we'll get into border pseudo-Christian science here. X-rays say that she has this. You call them a lie. <laughs> That's like saying if your name is, is Bob, you say, my name is not Bob. If your name is Bob, your name is Bob. You can't say that it's not. Well, I guess you can. You may not, but you can. <laughs> time, I suggest, and I need time, a few weeks at least. Where could I have failed? I prayed, I fasted, anointed with oil. Others had joined me. It couldn't be my fault due to a lack of faith. These precious other people, dear friends, they believed deeply too. It wasn't God's fault. He was true to his word and his promises. Why, 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 oh my God, why? My wife's words crushed into my silent world. I think we should proceed with the surgery. A site in San Francisco at a university hospital had been suggested. Proceed and not give God more time to heal her? I moved like Perry Mason, closing in on the chief suspect. The problem, wife, is you and your lack of faith. You trust the doctor and not God. You're unspiritual. It was suddenly clear, this must be the answer. In fact, my reasoning ran wild. Her lack of faith in this area demonstrates her total lack of faith. See, if you can't believe for the simple things, then you can't even believe God for salvation or anything. Any ministerial failure in our young pastoral career must have been due to her faithlessness. I loved her. I never felt this way before, but now she became my scapegoat, my dumping ground. By blaming her, I could salvage my personal faith, and more importantly, I could protect the integrity of my God and of his word. This message will be continued.